I'm glad you're here and hope you have your Bibles and ready to turn and look at some scripture with me this morning. Uh, we'll be looking at a passage in Matthew 6 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I have some good news for you this morning, and that is um, today uh, we'll be bringing uh, our series on biblical stewardship to an end. Um, not that I have exhausted everything we could say about biblical stewardship, not by any stretch of the imagination, but I think I've exhausted you. So uh, we'll, we'll begin something new next Sunday. I'm not sure what. I've been praying about that. Uh, I hadn't planned on this series on biblical stewardship, but, um, you know, we were kind of led in that direction in recent days. So I hope, I hope that the Lord has uh, given you some uh, biblical material uh, that will be a part of uh, your life of stewardship going forward. Um, I, uh, I have some heroes in, in my life some pastors that I have always looked up to, and I want to tell you about Pastor Dangerfield. Pastor Dangerfield was um, already an, an old guy when I first met him as a young pastor. He, uh, he pastored in a small church in our association here uh, in the Somerville area, actually. Uh, he was a bivocational pastor. I think he worked at the Navy Yard for years and years, but pastored as well. And uh, when we met together uh, for pastor's uh, lunches or conferences uh, through the association, I always sought him out uh, because I wanted to sit with him at lunch because he always had a great story. And he was a great storyteller. And I remember one story in particular um, of all that he told, it was about a church member. I think he was a church member or maybe one uh, who attended his church, but he looked at him as a church member. But he was always getting in trouble. Um, he was always uh, uh, having to get bailed out. I mean, literally. Uh, on a number of occasions, Reverend Dangerfield would get a call in the middle of the night, and it'd be this guy, and uh, he'd be in jail. He'd gotten in some kind of scuffle or something and thrown in jail, and, and um, he would ask Pastor Dangerfield to come bail him out. Um, and so uh, the phone rang late one Saturday night, and... It was this guy. He was calling from a jailhouse across the border, across the Savannah River, over somewhere in a small town in Georgia. And he said, here I am. I'm in jail. Can you come and get me? And Reverend Dangerfield said, well, listen, it's late. I mean, I got, I got to preach in the morning. And you want me to drive all the way over there to Georgia and get you out of jail? He said, I, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. And the guy started bawling and started crying and started begging. He said, you're the only one that, that, that can help me. So Reverend Dangerfield said, okay, okay, stop crying. I'm coming. So he headed over to Georgia, three or four hour drive in the middle of the night, um, got there, paid a fine, bailed him out, put him in the car, and they were heading back to South Carolina, back to Berkeley County, I think it was. And, and so uh, this guy, of course, fell asleep immediately, which Reverend Dangerfield said, I was really glad that he did fall asleep because I was afraid of what I'd tell him if he, if he was awake. But he said, I prayed that I could stay awake. And about an hour from home, the guy decides to wake up, and he's all refreshed and ready to talk. And he can see that Reverend Danger feels a little upset with him. And so he starts telling Reverend Dangerfield, you know, I know you don't think this 
Pastor Dangerfield, but I'm really a good guy, and, and I'm a good Christian. He said, you know what? Trying to, you know, make his case that he was a good Christian. He said, you might not believe this, but I send money all the time to Jim and Tammy at PTL. And I sometimes give to Jimmy Swigert. Well, Reverend Dangerfield sitting at the table and telling this story. And we we're all eagerly waiting to hear what he had to say to this guy. But he takes a bite of fried chicken, takes a sip of sweet tea, and finally somebody said, well, what did you say to him? And he was a master storyteller, you know, impeccably great with his timing. He took out a napkin, wiped his mouth, and he said, well, I told him, I told that scoundrel that the next time he wanted to get in a bar fight and get thrown in jail, call Jim Baker <laughs> or call Mike or Jimmy Swaggart, but don't call me. And you know, it says something, and the reason I'm telling you this story is it tells you something about the ministry of the local church, for one thing. It tells you about the importance of a local congregation. But it also tells you something about what I would call the bankruptcy of the prosperity gospel. And I want to make this point because we've talked so long about giving, about stewardship. I don't want anybody to be confused about where we come from as a church, where I come from as a pastor. And I believe that the prosperity gospel, the so-called prosperity gospel, is a false gospel. If anyone gains from the prosperity gospel, it's those who preach it and teach it and their organizations. One recent, fairly recent estimate of the personal worth of a certain pastor in a certain church in Houston, Texas, was that his personal worth was $50 million. I'm not jealous, okay? I'm not jealous. Because there is something profoundly dissimilar between that pastor who's still on television, you can see him anytime you want to see him, He's all over cable television. But there's something profoundly dissimilar between that pastor's pursuit of wealth and the Jesus of Nazareth who said to a would-be follower, the foxes of the field have dens, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Do you see the difference? The prosperity gospel's false premise is that if you will, by faith, you got to have faith, a lot of faith, if you will, by faith, give a certain amount of money to a certain ministry or to a certain church, you will prosper in, in health and in wealth in ways that you can't imagine. You'll get rich, they preach, because it's God's will, they say, for every believer, every person of faith to be incredibly healthy and wealthy, though not necessarily wise. It just takes faith, faith that is demonstrated by what you give to that ministry or to that church. If you listen, they unapologetically distort and twist and take key passages of Scripture out of context. One proponent of the prosperity gospel paraphrased 
Psalm 23, 1, as the Lord is my banker and I have good credit. As I see it, the prosperity gospel is a sanctified version of greed. The same deceit that Adam and Eve fell into when there they were in the garden. We talked about this. They had everything they wanted, everything they needed, except they wanted more, right? Greed. The true gospel is not the gospel of selfish gain, of earthly treasures. The true gospel is not the gospel of selfish gain and earthly treasures. The true gospel teaches us to lay up treasures in heaven. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lays out a vision for biblical stewardship that is focused on the eternal rather than the temporal. In a key passage, beginning with uh, Matthew 6, 19, if you have your Bibles open to this passage, we're going to look at it with you. Jesus said, do not store up. That word store up there in the original language means to stack up, like you're stacking books one on top of another or stacking things one on top of another as if there is excess, stacking them up in a storage facility, in a barn or in a closet or something, like the man who said, look, I, look at this harvest. I've got to build bigger barns. Storing up, stacking up. Jesus said, do not store up, stack up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. In other words, all material things, whatever they are, no matter how valuable they are, are vulnerable to decay, to destruction, or the thievery. But verse 20, Jesus says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, I think Jesus is teaching us that every act of love, every act of kindness and compassion and mercy and forgiveness Every act that mimics our master, every act that is done, every word that is spoken that comes out of the character of the Lord Jesus who lives in us is stacking up or storing up treasures in heaven. And so he says in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now this should remind you about what we talked about last week when we talked about, um, you know, when they asked Jesus about, you know, giving taxes to Caesar. And he said, well, show me your coin. And it had Caesar's image on it. He said, Who's, whose image is on the coin? And they said, well, it's, it's Caesar's image. And Jesus said, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God. And we said, if you're a Christ follower, if you have been born again and Christ lives in you, then Christ's image has been imprinted on your heart. So your heart belongs to God. So give God what is God's. And so if your heart belongs to God, whose home is in heaven, that's where your heart is. Your heart is where your treasure is, and your treasure it's God. Your treasure is life in God. Your treasure is Jesus. Jesus 
It was the treasure hidden in a field that the man found and went and sold everything to buy the field so that he can have that treasure. He's the pearl of great price. Jesus is the treasure imprinted on your hearts. And where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. Now look at verse 24. And this is what Jesus says. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I don't know how the preachers of the prosperity gospel handle that particular passage. And I think that's why Jesus presses home the teaching that comes later in chapter 6 of Matthew, where he's, he's teaching the crowd, you know, don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry about anything. Your Father in heaven knows what you need. Don't be anxious about what you're going to eat. Don't be anxious about what you're going to wear. And he says in verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added as well. And I hear Jesus saying that if, if we set our hearts on the kingdom of God, the Father's going to provide for what we need. We don't need to worry about it. Not by making us rich, but making us righteous in his eyes. As we model the master in self-denial, take up the cross, and following him in faithful obedience and in the hope of the promised kingdom, a promised inheritance that will be ours at the coming of the kingdom. But finally, let me distinguish the, the, the false prosperity gospel from the true gospel, which I would call the gospel of grace. The true gospel, the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace is the gospel of sacrificial self-giving love that is the heart of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 1 John 4, 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And John 15, 12, and 13, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Personal gain is not the motive of biblical stewardship. You don't give to get. We give because we love. And we love because God first loved us. We give because in Christ we have received the immeasurable riches of his grace. And this grace more than compensates, more than compensates for anything we perceive we have loss for the sake of the kingdom. The grace of God enables, enables us through the Holy Spirit working in us to be everything God has called us to be and do everything he's called us to do, including the call to biblical Stewardship. I mean, we're often surprised with God's enabling grace when he does challenge us to step out in faith and do something we don't feel capable of or do something 
we're afraid to do or do something we just we just think we're going to fall on our faces and somehow maybe it was some act of ministry or maybe it was going on a mission trip or, or maybe it was some service that somebody called you to to do uh, for the church for the sake of Christ and you're thinking I, there's no way I can do this but somehow you stepped out in faith and you gave your best and God enabled you to do it and you're the most surprised person in the world. That's the grace of God, the enabling grace of God that we so generously receive from him. After the stoning death of Stephen in Acts 7, the church in Jerusalem fell in some hard times through some persecution, and uh, they were ostracized, the believers in the church, uh, they, and many of them didn't have jobs, and they just fell into a period of, of many years of hardship and, and, and poverty. I mean, it was a def, desperate kind of thing. And the Apostle Paul, I don't know if it was his idea originally, but he had the idea that we need, we need to take care of the mother church. And so as he went around and as he established churches, along with some of the other apostles and some of the missionaries that worked with Paul and the others, as they established churches, they began to collect a fund that they were going to take to Jerusalem to, to kind of rescue them from their, their state of poverty. And this was important to Paul. I mean, he felt an obligation to the church. Uh, but he also wanted the young churches and the young believers in those new churches to feel an obligation also to give to the mother church in Jerusalem. So the church at Corinth had committed to, to give a, a, a sum of money to this collection um, for the relief of the Jerusalem church. But for some reason, they didn't follow through. They kind of dropped the ball. Some time had gone by, maybe as long as a year, and, and, and the fund just sat there, and nobody was giving anything to it. They kind of just, kind of just forgot about it. And so Paul wrote to them, and challenged them to finish collecting the offering for this urgent cause. And he uses the churches in Macedonia as an example to challenge the church at Corinth. And, and I don't know whether, um, you know, you see it that, this way or not, but uh, you know the, the characterization of Jewish mothers. Uh, Paul was kind of like this with the church at Corinth, using the Macedonia uh, churches as an example. Like, like, well, your sister over there, she made all A's. I don't know why you can't make all A's. And so he's saying to the church at Corinth, I, I want to I tell you what the Macedonian churches have done to challenge you that you can do better. And so using the Macedonian church as an example of sacrificial giving, um, what he writes to them, I think, is, is a really wonderful blueprint uh, for what we call the grace of giving, the grace of giving. And so look at this passage. We're going to run through it very briefly, but 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 12, Paul writes, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace. I mean, notice the language here, about the grace that God has given the Macedonian Christians. This is that enabling grace, okay? Uh, that enabling grace that helps you do what you think you can't do. And so he says, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. And he says, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. 
And so he's saying, you know, they're going through a period of, of trial and hardship themselves. But, you know, they, they, they have an overflowing joy in the Lord and in the midst of extreme poverty. Somehow, they had the spirit of generosity. He says, verse 3, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. In other words, I, I kind of get the impression that the Macedonian churches heard about the collection of the funds uh, even before they were asked to contribute to the funds. And so on their own, uh, they began to take up this offering for the Jerusalem church. And so he says in verse 4, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. And what Paul says next is, I think the simple blueprint or model for the grace of giving. Look what he says. They gave themselves first, of, first of all, to the Lord. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And this is the key. They gave their hearts to the Lord first. They devoted themselves to the Lord first. And then, by the will of God, also to us. So their first step in the grace of giving was they gave their hearts to the Lord. And the second step was they sought the will of God concerning what to give. And so Paul says, verse 6, so we urged Titus. Now Titus was sort of the emissary between Paul and the churches. He was one of his co-laborers. And he says, so we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have, we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I love that. And folks, you know, maybe as part of the final word from me, to you about biblical stewardship, this would be my prayer and hope for Old Fort Baptist Church. Not that you haven't been before, but that you will be going forward, that we will continue to strive to be a church that excels in the grace of giving. But look what Paul says in verse 8. I am not commanding you. I'm not commanding you. He's an apostle, uh, but, he's not, but he's not God. He's not commanding them. He's not ordering them. Giving should be a willing exercise, not something we do under duress, but something we do cheerfully, right? Which is what he says in the next chapter, um, where he says, you know, God loves a cheerful giver, a, a giver who is joyful and happy and giving what he gives, not, not, you know, sad and not begrudging and not resentful, you know, writing out that, that check to Old Fort Baptist Church, but the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And so he continues, but I want to testify the sincerity of your love by comparing it, I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. In other words, the Macedonian churches. And then, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now catch this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, rich in heavenly power and glory, Yet for your sake he became poor, 
both in his humanity and his humility, but also in his poverty. So that you, through his poverty, might become rich, not rich materially, but rich in heavenly riches, rich toward God. Verse 10, and here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. I mean, they were, they were fast out of, out of the box, but, you know, like, like the tortoise and the hare, you know, they decided to, uh, they didn't need to be in a hurry, and they got sidetracked. And so he says, now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. In other words, you started out well, finish well. Finish well. Don't be quitters. Finish what you started. And then he says, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. This is important. Which is to say, our stewardship, our stewardship is only based on what God has provided what he has entrusted to us, what we have, not what we don't have. Biblical stewardship is a combination of common sense, living within your means, and uncommon grace, giving within your means. As God puts it on your heart to give. So it starts with the heart, not a part of your heart, but the whole heart. Listen, some of you are tithing your heart, you're giving a, a portion to God and holding back on the rest. You can't tithe your heart. If Jesus is imprinted on your heart, your heart belongs to God. Give Caesar what is Caesar's. Give God what is God. Thank you for viewing this message from Old Fort Baptist Church. Here at Old Fort, we value biblical truth, missional living, and vital connections. To learn more about who we are and what we do, please visit us online at oldfortbaptist.org. To help support the ongoing ministry of the church, you can give at oldfortbaptist.org give. Thank you, and God bless.